All right, it's Graham. What's cracking? You know the drill. Uh, as part of my Animorphs reread, well, okay, that's a misnomer. It's me finishing the series, so I'm catching up on the ones that I didn't read, and uh, that's like 15, it's more than 15, fewer than 20, I don't know the exact number. And uh, I wanted to tackle one of the bigger ones, which was the Elemist Chronicles. There were, I think, three of the Chronicles books, four, I guess if you count Visser, that, you know, for the most part, they were self-contained, but they did also connect to the larger series, usually in the form of an epilogue or something. So you, you would read them kind of in order with the others. And, uh, geez, like, I remember I read the Andalite Chronicles in 8th grade, or I read the Hork-Bajir Chronicles in 10th grade, and, uh, or maybe it was 9th. Yeah, no, it was 9th, and then in 10th grade it was Visser. Like, I have such fond memories of these books that I remember where I was in life when I read them. But I, I bailed on the Animorph series probably right before Elemist came out, and... Like, I, I don't necessarily lament that just because this was the most ambitious of any of the books in that series that K.A. Applegate you know, ever put together. Now, I do understand that it was her and her husband, predominantly, who were steering the series. And also, uh, you know, she had a whole fleet of ghost riders, but I'm not going to run through the complete list of them and like give every one of them acknowledgements as I go it's like you know her name was on the cover she's mentioned after the fact that these other people helped her it is what it is uh, I am going to do videos on all of these books but I will go like find the Animorphs wiki online and just kind of brush up on the summaries then and, and share my two cents somebody on on Twitter tagged me in a mutual and said hey like you might check this podcast out it's a book podcast and it's like, all right, so I, I listened to it today, and they were covering the second book in the series, and it was these two nerds that were, like, really trying too hard to find, like, profound literary analysis in this middle grade series. It was like, it was, it was good, and here's things that it touches on, but it, they were doing that meme where, like, a high school teacher makes you analyze and find things that weren't there. It's like, well, I think she was trying to say this or tie this in there, and it's like, look... <laughs> I'm not going to try to speak for the author. I'm just going to tell you that as an author, the things you are looking for are not there. She's just writing this cool story. There are some themes. There are some larger issues that it tackles, but she's not trying to weave in all this extra profound symbolism with this, that, the other thing. Like She's putting limitations on the world building, and that's that. <laughs> like I, I'm not going to do that. That said, you know, as I'm reading the Elemist Chronicles... I'm thinking like there are there are definitely some deeper themes here in this story about a mortal alien who through a very analog process more or less ascends to godhood. Uh, if you are unfamiliar, the Elemist is a character in Animorphs who is basically a god. He's kind of like, oh, seriously, I'm, it, it's midnight and there's a dude who just drove by me with a mask on by himself in the car. Like, why? Are we st it's four years. Why are we doing this? I digress. He's like Q from Star Trek, but he's not so malevolent or you know, chaotic or anything like that. In fact, he's got very strict rules on himself to limit the extent to which he interferes with sentient species. And he's popped up a couple of times. There was one like within the first dozen books, and then I specifically remember it was one of the books in like the mid twenties. Um, he picks the six animorphs and uh, a robot named Eric. Who? Long story. He's uh, he's what's called a, a chi. He's an android built by a, a dead alien race. Uh, the Elemist takes the seven of them and drops them on an alien planet to fight seven champions of a, a different you know, solar deity named the Krayak. And they've gotten hints of the Krayak before, uh, and they're not sure exactly why they've got to do this. The Animorphs, you know, they don't want to kill, and they don't think that this is really going to solve the problem. They're trying to figure out what it is that the Krayak wants with this particular planet. You know, it was, it was fascinating. And uh, you get to know a little bit more about, you know, the Elemist and 
this enemy of his, but not too much. Well, the Elamist Chronicles gives you that story. And it's kind of told in three parts. Um, I like the way that she uses the scale of time in this. You know, if, if we're going off of the Big Bang Theory and assuming that the entire universe is 14 billion years old and that the Earth was formed about 4 billion years ago, then somewhere along that timeline, you could make the case that, you know, other planets have, you know, formed, populated, had multiple extinction level events, then died out, and, uh, and all of that before Earth ever became a thing. And so closer to the dawn of the universe, there's this planet called Ket. There's a race on it called the Ketrans, and one of them is an entity known as Tumen, who later becomes the Elemist. Now, the world building is established in this series very quickly. It's all on the fly, and you've got to glean it as you go. Ketrans are more or less humanoid. They have arms and legs. They also have wings. They have beaks. They have, he, he calls them pods. Um, you, know, you, you dock with them. You perch with them. They do some bird things. They do some humanoid things. Uh, it's not overly described. You just you pick it up as you go. And they are advanced enough that they've got computer systems and software, and they are on the verge of setting off to explore, you know, deep space. And Tumen is on the older edge of adolescence, and he's about to become a, a young adult. And he and some of his friends are gamers. They have very immersive gaming systems among the cat. And one particular game deals with... Uh, you know, interfering with alien civilizations, you know, figuring out what you might affect in order to give them the greatest chance of maximizing their potential with the least amount of interference. That's relevant for later. And uh, he is not very good at the game, Tumen. In fact, he, he loses a lot, but he learns from his losses. Uh, there's a transient quality to the civilizations on Ket. Um, there are these floating crystal cities up in the high atmosphere because conditions on the surface aren't suitable for life. And, you know, everybody clings on to these crystal ships and, you know, you take turns, you know, flapping your wings to keep them afloat as you go. And so, you know, society has very strong communal ties because everybody pulls their weight to keep the crystals flying. You get a certain amount of time, you know, off of the perches so that you can do your own thing. And so everybody's really, you know, efficient with their time uses, but there are technological innovations that are changing the way these societies work. You know, one particular crystal has invented an anti-grav engine so that nobody will need to fly anymore. Nobody will need to, to pull, rather. And uh, that's going to change, you know, how they use their time. So then you start coming up against discussions between conservatism and progressivism, at least in a technological or societal sense. Do we keep doing the things the way that we have just because we've always done them that way? Or do, do we embrace this radical change? One particular spire that they encounter on a flyby has also implemented democracy, which is a completely new concept to them, and uh, I would run screaming through their ranks saying, don't do this, it's very stupid, but <laughs> that's just me. And, uh, you know, these things all inform Tumen. You know, he, he kind of has concerns about them because he's able to grasp, due to his affinity for the game, some of the long-reaching consequences of these changes to society. Well, one of the crystals was also messing around with radio waves and they were beaming the games into deep space. This got the attention of an alien race that didn't know the games were games and they thought that the Kets were these you know, completely meddling, ignoble alien types that like to mess with and end other civilizations. So they send an invading force to Ket and just start murdering people by the millions. And uh, very few of them escape, about a hundred of them escape. Tumen is one of them. And he makes his first kill ever against one of these aliens called the Capucins. And uh, that ends kind of his, his first era of life. Fifty years later, he's an adult on a, on a searching vessel. They've managed to adapt some of these Capucin ships. And uh, they're out looking for a planet similar to Ketra where they can you know, repopulate it. But chances are very, very slim. It's the rarest type of environment in the known galaxy. And uh, they're... You know, the odds aren't looking good. But they end up encountering this one weird planet where there's some biological entity that uh, it, it baits you, it pulls you in, and then it kind of does a Borg thing where it 
plugs you into the hive, but you're constantly plugged into it. You know, it sticks its tentacles in you or whatever. It absorbs your consciousness and you become, you know, part of the larger entity. You end up staying alive for countless years. And while technically this entity, they call it Father, has uh, killed and absorbed the consciousnesses of the other Ketrans, it does keep Tumen alive because he's a game player and it wants to play games with him. And uh, you know, over the course of, geez, however many years that he's stuck trapped to Father, he eventually figures a way to beat Father, overpower him, take his power, take all the technology from the ships that he's collected and pulled down to the surface of his little isolated world over the, the years and build this massive fleet that uh, also has a high-tech false body for him. It allows him to uh, no longer be bound by the needs of biology and uh, he begins the nascent steps of immortality and he travels from world to world. He's got power over other civilizations he can defeat their technology, he's able to stop conflicts and wars and stuff, and he starts doing real-world versions of the gaming stuff that he was doing before. But once again, there are consequences to this. He thinks he brings peace to civilizations and then finds out 100,000 years later that as a direct result of his interference, one of these races was completely annihilated. Like, it's, it's just gnarly. He becomes obsessed with this idea of doing what he can to foster and nurture life, but he's he's not an ace at it and that's why he has rules on limiting himself because he knows whatever he does is going to to affect something in a way that he can't predict on this cosmic quest the elemist he took this name because that was his gamer name back when he was a ketrin and you know now that he's doing all this stuff in real life he just he is tumen the elemist but the worlds know him as the elemist um he encounters an entity called the krayak this flying planet that is sort of the antithesis of him. He just wants to spread death and destruction. And uh, Krayak and Elemist end up you know, playing the game for real. And uh, the stakes are real. Uh, life flourishes in Elemist worlds and, and uh, languishes and dies in Krayak worlds. And uh, whenever they face off openly, uh, millions and millions of people suffer. Until, you know, finally, Krayak and Elemist, uh, the they have their final conflict and Krayak tricks Elemist into falling into a black hole where uh, his entire you know, fleet of ships and everything just get completely crushed and destroyed and uh, he's crushed down to the uttermost atom but he finds out that you know, he's still surviving and he becomes something else. This is where I'm going to pause and I know I'm kind of over explaining all of this. It's, it's an intense concept and it's extremely weird, especially if you're reading this book, you know, just hoping for another Animorphs adventure. But, you know, she's trying to explain the, uh, the exogenesis of, like I said, well, it's, it's apotheosis. It's a, a mortal becoming a god. She's trying to explain this uh, process without just taking the easy way out and saying, oh, and then he encountered some other cosmic god that said, okay, I'm going to wave my hand at you and you're going to have my power. It's like, no, he had to crawl his way up from the dregs of mortality into becoming this thing that was somewhat more. The only really speculative quality of it is what happens when he falls into the black hole and he's still alive. And, uh, you know, he's, he's able to bring Krayak in and, and uh, they become these two new ascended things. And they decide, uh, you know, they're going to continue their game and, and see who can ultimately win. Now, in the third act here, in this you know, third iteration of it, or prior, prior to falling into the black hole, rather, um, you get a few Easter eggs that tie into the main series. You find out that the Elemist landed on the Andalite homeworld and uh, encountered them when they were basically in their caveman stage. And he learned things from them, uh, especially about... You know, the, the quest for permanence through the creation of life, that even though they were going to suffer and that they had a low mortality rate, they were going to continue bringing life into the world. And uh, that provided a, um, a paradigm change for him. You know, as he was playing games back when he was a, a lowly cat mortal, he, was, he realized that he was limited to whatever the software programmers were able to do to the game. And that's why when he was encountering these different species in real life and watching them grow over tens of thousands of years, 
he was much more intrigued by them because there was a randomness to it that wasn't pre-programmed. He was watching actual life and he wanted to cultivate that and nurture that and the Andalites taught him something about that. He went and fostered and created his own race called the Pemelites, which were uh, you know, important in their own way in the series, which uh, again, I won't over explain. But, you know, seeing that he was literally their founder and then that they were wiped out by a race called the Howlers, which were literally the legions of Krayak, you see that this conflict has been playing out on, on various levels and scales for just countless eons. And that they've got reasons why they don't face each other openly. So the Easter eggs were good and everything. Um, understanding why a being of his power would choose to rein himself in was also fantastic and I think a story like this that was so incredibly ambitious and somewhat out of left field for a series that was more or less about kids turning into animals to fight an alien invasion I feel like she might have started with that basic concept and then just took a step back and said what if I focus on this one particular element and I, I run it to the most developed conclusion that I can come to. You know, what if there is a, a cosmic alien out there that more or less has the power of a god? Why wouldn't he intervene? And she ends up, rather advertently or inadvertently, answering an extremely profound question in a very accessible way. Uh, you know, this is questions. This is a question that uh, you know human religions have been wrestling with for thousands of years here on Earth. You know, if there is a real God out there, why doesn't he, he interfere and and stop all of my problems from happening? Well, there's something in this story that can give you something to chew on. You know, that's what the Elamist and the Krayak and their conflict is is all about. I was thoroughly impressed that she was able to address it in this way and treat it as seriously as it deserved while at the same time you know, more or less writing a piece of genre fiction about this weird bird alien guy who became something much much more if you're looking at the video i've more i'm sure i put the uh the cover of the book up on there there's this figure on the cover that looks like the illegitimate love child of gandalf and yoda uh <laughs> that's not at all what the um the Ketrans were described to look like, and I, I don't really think that uh, when he does become the, you know, the Elamist full-on later, that that's really what he looked like either. I don't know if the cover artist was just like, well, I got nothing to go off of, so I'm just going to draw this, and that's going to be what your cover is. Like, It gives you something cool to look at, um, and maybe he takes that form you know, later on. I would have to go back and read some of the earlier books to you know, see what the Animorphs described him as looking like when he popped up. I will say that K.A. Applegate had this weird habit of just randomly dropping in some alien that, uh, you know, was powerful, was ominous, was menacing, and also you never saw again. <laughs> like the Drode, for example, he was he was one such character. I, from what I understand, like he pops up again later, but there were aliens like that, and it, and it just got weird sometimes. The Animorphs was her best developed and most grounded series. Um, you know, she... Explored similar concepts with Everworld and Remnants. Everworld was really good. It was a little bit more serious. The ending was a bit of a mess. Remnants, the entire damn thing was a mess. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know, Animorphs ran for maybe a, a year longer than it should have. But if I get to the end of the Animorph series and I look back and I think, uh, you know, the, the peak of her accomplishments and it was the hork Bajir Chronicles and the Elemist Chronicles, then I, I can be satisfied with that. This was... Uh, a much better book, I think, than it had a right to be. And I'll probably read it again. And I'll probably just think, like I did this first time, this is really freaking weird, but she's got the seeds of something deeper and much more compelling in here. And kudos to her for being able to pull that off. So if you've read it, let me know what you think. Uh, that was a very deep and detailed summary, probably more than I meant to give, but uh, I'm, I'm very impressed with this weird little one-off book in a successful children's series from 25 years ago. All right, that's it. You guys know the drill. Drive safe. See you out there.